On June 9, 2003, Rick Walker was a free man after spending 12 years in some of California's most dangerous prisons for a murder he did not commit. He had no home, no job, and no idea what to do next. In California, like a handful of states across the country, people who are found factually innocent of their crimes are entitled to financial compensation for every day spent falsely imprisoned. Already a victim of law enforcement and the legal system, Rick Walker now faced a new battle within the California State Legislature. Would he be wronged by the system twice? I knew on the second day of a trial that had 6,600 pages of transcript that I was going to be convicted because the stage was set. In Rick's case, I think there was a convergence uh, of a defense lawyer who wasn't as well prepared as he should have been and a prosecutor who didn't turn over all of the exculpatory evidence. Rick Walker was uh, convicted of murdering Lisa Hopewell because he was a former boyfriend of Lisa's and, and therefore sort of a natural suspect when she was found dead. And the man who had murdered her, a, a young drug dealer by the name of Rashawn Bowers, was looking for a way to shift the blame to somebody else. At the time, Rick Walker was a self-employed auto mechanic helping to raise his son in East Palo Alto, California. He only knew Rasan Bowers because he had worked on his car. Lisa Hopewell, armed with an Ivy League education and a once promising career on the East Coast, had moved to California to be close to her family and to try to break her addiction to drugs and alcohol. On January 10, 1991, Hopewell was found murdered inside of her condominium in Cupertino, bound with duct tape and stabbed repeatedly. Police could not match Walker's fingerprints with any of those found at the scene of the crime but Bauer's prints were found on the duct tape used to restrain Hopewell. Under questioning, Bauer's falsely pointed to Walker as the actual murderer, and on March 9th, the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office arrested Walker and charged him with first-degree murder. I was really, really numb, you know. They were saying things, and I couldn't even hear them anymore. Their mouth was moving, but I couldn't hear a word they were saying. It was just as if I was in a room with some mutes. They were moving their mouths, nothing was coming out, and I was just stunned. Walker continued to insist he had nothing to do with the crime. Bowers, now a co-defendant and soon-to-be star witness, struck a deal with the district attorney's office that would soon seal Walker's fate. At a pivotal moment in the courtroom during a recess in the trial, an assistant DA approached Walker at the defense table to warn him of his fate. We're going to convict you. We're going to put Mr. Bowers on the stand. He's going to cry for the jury. They're going to be sympathetic for him. And we're going to convict you. You're going to get 25 years to life for this. And sure enough, when Mr. Bowers took the stand, he started crying. One of the jurors asked for tissue, and at that point, I said, I'm done. I am completely done. I think one of the things that Rick Walker's case illustrates is that when people with the authority of the state behind them are not careful about what they do, if they're not careful about who they arrest, if they're not careful about who they prosecute, if they're not careful about, careful about whether they follow the rules or not, real human beings suffer the consequences. On December 10, 1991, Walker was convicted and sentenced to 26 years to life for the murder of Lisa Hopewell. At the time, Allison Tucker was a third-year law student at Stanford. She got involved in the case at the request of her mother, who had been a longtime friend and colleague of Walker's mother. Tucker began to research the case, interview potential new witnesses, and piece together facts that didn't make it into the courtroom, showing that Walker had nothing to do with Hopewell's murder. She would, over the course of a decade, work to prove Walker's innocence. 
Allison Tucker was just a dog with a bone on this case. She grabbed onto it from day one. She was absolutely convinced of the innocence of her client, and for no other reason than the fact that she thought it was the right thing to do. She just stayed with it year after year after year. The reason I took on Rick's case is because I really believed that he was innocent, and I couldn't think of any thing else to do to try to help him. If you can transport yourself back to that time with the facts known at that time, um, looked like he was guilty and we were doing the right thing. This just appalled me. The judge in my case fell asleep during the trial. He's not old and he deserves to take a nap during the day, but not at my expense. He fell asleep during my trial. With no physical evidence, false testimony, and questionable legal tactics, the mistakes made in the Walker case permeated almost every aspect of the judicial system. The rules are there to protect people who are innocent, and because the prosecutor didn't play scrupulously by the rules, and the sheriff's department didn't play scrupulously by the rules, uh, they weren't able to protect an innocent man in this case. What I think has happened in the course of the last 40 years is more careerism uh, in the criminal justice system. Prosecutors who that's all they're going to do and they start to look at the defense lawyers um, as scum of the earth. I mean they really do. We're the good guys, they're the bad guys. And it's the prob same problem with defense lawyers. They start thinking that all prosecutors are Nazis and it kind of breaks down the level of mutual respect for the role that they each play within the system. The goal isn't to win, the goal is to make sure that justice gets done. Those are two very different goals. And when you have a win at all cost, whether it's in politics or the law, um, then bad things are going to happen. The district attorneys were in the elevator going down after my conviction. And one said to the other, I never thought you'd win this case. I never thought you had a chance to win the case against Walker. Here's your nickel. And my father was in the elevator and heard them talking and witnessed this entire thing. And it basically just tore him apart that two men thought that my life was worth a nickel and they bet a nickel on my life. Rick Walker spent the next 12 years in some of California's toughest prisons, including San Quentin and Pelican Bay. That first day in, in that cell and just, the, first, the thing I remember was this huge door and this huge lock and this tray slot, you know, and everything's blam, boom, click, you know, and, and then at 10 o'clock at night, there's this eerie silence. One of the rules Walker came to live by in prison was to anticipate the worst and hope for the best. With all of his appeals exhausted, he spent the next 12 years quietly hoping that someday he would be exonerated. By February 2003, Tucker decided she finally had enough evidence to present to the DA's office proving Walker's innocence. Department investigators were sent to Mule Creek State Prison to tell Walker the outcome of their investigation. And from what we uh, gather and what we understand, you're innocent. Imagine what that felt like going back to your cell, hearing that from um, the district attorney's office's personal police. Imagine what that felt like, you know? My feet, I didn't ever feel, I don't remember my feet touching the ground going back to my building. I don't. I just drifted along going back to my building say, my God, finally, somebody believes, you know. I mean, there, there's only one right thing to do when you have an innocent person in prison. You get them out and you do everything you can uh, to mitigate the damage and everything you can think of and you do whatever you can to prevent it from happening in the future. In California, when someone who's been convicted of a crime completes their sentence and is released from prison, they're given a small sum of money, a suit of clothes, and help in finding a place to live. When someone who has been exonerated because they were wrongfully convicted, when they're released from prison, they get absolutely nothing. They just open the doors and say, see ya. 
a parolee gets a, a small sum of money, but a, an exoneree doesn't even get that. There's no, um, there's no governmental way to immediately uh, provide for someone who walks out of prison a free man. In California, we do have a remedy that state government provides um, of $100 a day for every day of wrongful imprisonment if you can prove that you were convicted, even though you were innocent of the crime, through no fault of your own. That financial remedy, spelled out in California Penal Code 4904, is administered by the Victims' Compensation and Government Claims Board, who submit the requests as part of a larger biannual claims bill voted on by the legislature. The criteria to qualify for remuneration involves a series of steps, and by many accounts, the process can be cumbersome and time-consuming. The delays in paying these claims uh, are often a couple of years. I mean, so we're not giving any immediate assistance to people who are, are being exonerated. I've heard firsthand stories of bureaucratic nightmares with people uh, not getting the money they're entitled to, not getting it in a timely fashion, statute of limitations issues uh, not being appropriate. And it can take not just months, but years for a person to collect, even when that person is, as Rick Walker was, 100% clearly entitled to that money. When I realized that the claims bill for the pending legislative session was uh, about to be finalized and that the legislature was about to go home for the year and that it would probably be a whole other year before Rick got his money, I decided we needed to take some extraordinary steps. And at that point, I called uh, Joe Simidian. At the time, Joe Simidian was a California state assemblyman. His district included East Palo Alto, which made Rick Walker one of his constituents. I got a phone call one day from Allison Tucker. I was in my district office in Palo Alto. Uh, out of the blue, call comes in. Uh, can you help us with the Victims' Compensation and Appeals Board? Things are stuck. They said, sorry, but you know we're victims of our own agenda. The issue's moving along, but it's just not going to be in time to be heard before the legislature recesses for the year. Simidian then tried to amend the current claims bill, which happened to be making its way through the system, but was met with resistance from the bill's author, who cited procedural concerns and instructed colleagues not to bring up the bill if the Walker Amendment was in it. And so, you know, now we've uh, gone from hoping we can make the bureaucracy work without success to hoping we can use an existing piece of legislation without success. And we're down to the final few days of the session, and it's looking less and less likely that we're going to be able to make anything happen. And ultimately, I decide that I'll amend a piece of my own legislation that's on a totally unrelated topic. I can't even remember at this point what the other bill was about. Uh, and uh, we do what's called a gut and amend. We just take the whole bill apart and put Rick Walker's claim in it as a standalone claim uh, and uh, take it from there with the clock ticking over the last couple of days of the session. This is an incredible building where many things come together. Money, power, greed, ambition, partisanship, uh, and genuine civic responsibility and civic duty. There are immense possibilities here. Uh, they can do things for incredible good in this state. Um, they also can be, um, act like little kids on a playground and get nothing done. Uh, it is, um, I, I've seen some of the most impressive moments uh, of my life in, inside this building, and I've also seen some of the saddest, lamentable moments of my life here. Often we are just um, driven by our partisanness, unfortunately, to a degree that is really not healthy. Um, I'll be honest, I, d I don't like it so much, and, uh, but you're looked upon a little aghast if you, you know, go too, too off the reservation, so to speak, every, you know, too often. Why is it more partisan? I, I can't answer that. I guess those people who have strong feelings into politics, maybe, maybe that's it. I find myself in a very partisan environment, yet I'm a, a, a more moderate Republican, therefore I don't always take the extreme right views. I l try to look at things, in a, I believe, in a more balanced, from a more balanced position. At no other time in Sacramento is partisanship more evident than during the last night of a legislative session, and September 12, 2003 was no exception. It would go down as one of the most bitterly divided in recent history. The specter of the Gray Davis recall, 
a $38 billion deficit, and the usual push and shove of ideologies weighed heavily on the ability of legislators to get things done that night. The Assembly Republicans, who had earlier crafted a deal that included funding for law enforcement, felt betrayed by the omission of those programs in the final version of the budget. In response, Republican leadership instructed its members to vote no or abstain from voting on any bill requiring a two-thirds vote, which would essentially prevent any budget bill from passing. AB 1302, the Rick Walker bill, was just one of those. I knew that the bill required a two-thirds vote. That's 54 votes. There were 47 Democrats who I hoped would vote for the bill. That means I needed seven Republican votes, just that simple. Uh, I sat down with Dave Cox, who was the minority leader at the time, the Republican leader, and uh, made my case and uh, you know, said I hoped that an exception could be made. You know, what happens in the last days and last hours of a session is that you use whatever tools are available to you. And uh, Mr. Walker just happened to get caught up in, in this particular situation. The sense in the minority at the end of session is similar to their sense at the budget time because of the two-thirds vote requirement. Uh, and that is, finally somebody wants my opinion. Finally somebody needs my vote. When you feel like you're being abused, uh, when you're not able to get your bills heard, your bills out, then you have to take whatever steps are necessary under the rules. I approached uh, the speaker, Democratic Speaker Herb Wesson, and said, uh, you know, Herb, I uh, I need to bring this bill up, even though it's a two-thirds bill, and uh, Herb was, uh, you know, not, not very enthusiastic. I told him that it was a dead stick. I said, I don't see it happening, because they were so angry. Then he said, well, you know, why would you bring it up if you know it's going to lose? And I said, well, I don't really feel like I can go back to my constituent and say, gee, I'm sorry, it was hard, we didn't try. He goes through the argument that he had been giving me all night and it fell on deaf ears. I'm not even paying attention to it. Until he said these words, I feel some magic going on. I said, what do you mean? I can't explain it, Mr. Speaker, but I think, I feel this special magic. So I said, okay, I will allow you to take up the bill. You know, you're standing there, it's 2.20 in the morning, and you think, I don't know how I'm going to make this work. The clock is running, you're, you know, literally, you know that in a matter of minutes or, you know, an hour or so at most, the year is over. Your opportunity to make things right for this guy is gone. I respectfully ask for an I vote. Members, I know that the 54 vote bills face some problems between our parties and our two houses. Let me just say, Mr. Walker isn't an assemblyman, he isn't a senator, I don't know whether he's a Democrat or a Republican, I only know that the system has made him a victim once, please do not let the system make him a victim twice. I respectfully ask for an aye vote. Debate discussion, members, Mr. Cox. Madam Speaker, members, I thank Mr. Simidian for his presentation, and I know how important it is to Mr. Simidian that this, uh, this person receive just and due compensation, which has been awarded. And I regret, regret that we're at a time when, uh, when Mr. Smitty and I, I need, as I told you earlier, because of circumstances, need to say no. This is a 54-vote bill. There are claims, period. Regrettably, uh, Mr. Walker will not fit into this claims, period. But because of the circumstances, because of the circumstances, we're going to ask our colleagues to either lay off or vote no. It was a very, very straightforward thing to do. You know, if we have a chance to right a wrong now and then, I think we, it's incumbent upon us to do it. And I was very moved by uh, Joe's remarks and by the story of Mr. Walker and what he had been put through. It is my argument that a vote um, against this measure is indeed a vote for the bureaucracy and against the humanity that we should be about on every measure that we, that we vote on here in this House. I can't imagine that any of us, I, I, I have a hard time imagining that any of us would be 
so cold-hearted as to be able to say, well, you know, darn, it's a shame about that poor fellow, but we have a little political thing that we're playing tonight, and what the hell, it's 2.38 in the morning, the people aren't going to see it, they're not going to know what we're doing, and so this guy just kind of gets ground up in the wheels. One of the claims bills that are also pending is one of a similar circumstance for one person in my district as well. And yet, I'm not going to make that presentation because I knew, I knew that we were not going to vote on it. And I would not put anyone to the task of not having to put their vote up because I knew what was going to happen. With a divided legislature and a Republican strategy to block every two-thirds bill, Semidian pressed ahead and made a final plea to his colleagues. Uh, Mr. Semidian, you may close. Thank you, members. Members, I have a duty and an obligation to try and make the system work one person at a time. We are ordinary people here, members. But when ordinary people cannot respond to extraordinary circumstances to make the system work, there is something seriously wrong with that system. When Mr. Walker was arrested, he had a good job as a self-employed mechanic and a reliable income. Today he has no home, no job, no income, and no assets. During the 12 years that he was incarcerated, his son grew up and his father died. It is very rare on the floor of this House, members, that we have an opportunity to set a wrong right. We have that opportunity tonight for one person. I believe that opportunity is also our opportunity to show 35 million Californians that we have the right stuff. I would respectfully ask for an aye vote. Members of all debate having ceased, the clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote. All members vote. All members vote. Clerk will close the roll, tally the vote. Mr. Semidian moves a call. To move a call is parliamentary language that, in essence, puts the final vote of a bill on hold temporarily. This allowed Semidian a small window of time to make his case directly to his Republican colleagues one-on-one. -on -one. You know, when we got those first two Republican votes, when the votes uh, went up on the board and there were 49 votes, uh, you know, a, a, a mixed reaction on my part. On the one hand, uh, you know, I'm not at 54. I've come up short. On the other hand, hey, there's some hope. There's some daylight. I've got two members of the other party who have been willing to cross the line. And after listening to the story, uh, even though we had discussed not supporting any Democrat bills, I just felt that it was the right thing to do and I had to vote for it. I'm a physician. I have to make decisions. So, and I, I was not going to say no to that vote. I just couldn't say no to the vote because on that issue. It's such an important issue. I wasn't going to let my vote say a person who's in prison for 12 years, no, you can't have justice right now. It's clear to me that if Rick Walker's case remains somehow fouled by the contentious nature of the partisan debate over the budget, uh, we're never going to get to 54. And so I have to go desk by desk, colleague by colleague, member by member, and look these folks in the eye and say, I need your help. This is the right thing to do. This is a guy who spent 12 years in prison, who has a right to get on with his life, and we have the ability tonight to make that happen, but I can only do that with your help. Joe went personally, desk to desk, legislator to legislator. I, I remember distinctly that he kneeled down and he would talk to them, eyeball to eyeball. I think Joe Semidian on that night used every tactic possible, everyone and maybe created some new ones that I don't know anything about. So I'm down on one knee. I'm talking to my colleagues. I'm trying to pull them into Rick Walker's life story. And, you know, so painful, you know, desk after desk, member after member, people saying, I can't, I just can't. We've been given direction by our leadership. 
Uh, and then, you know, the moments of hope when you bump into a Pat Bates who says, all right, I'll do that. Uh, you bump into a Dennis Mountjoy, conservative Republican from Southern California, who says, I'm there. And I say, really? And he says, it's the right thing to do. And, uh, you know, then you think, well, maybe there are others out there that I can get to. But the clock's ticking, and it's later, and it's later. And you know that, you know, in a matter of minutes, you're going to be out of time, and you need 54 votes. And, uh, you know, when it was finally time to take the second and final vote, I, I didn't have the votes, as far as I could tell. Uncertain if AB 1302 would get the 54 votes needed, Simidian's bill went before the legislature one last time. After this e extraordinary person-to-person -person appeal, there was a, fi a final vote. And again, the Republicans held back. The Democrats supported it. And the Assembly Speaker Pro Tem kept saying, anyone who wants to vote, cast your ballot. Anyone who wants to vote, you know, hit your button. Anyone who wants to vote, hit your button over and over and over again, not wanting to call the roll dead. Clerk will post. All members vote. All members vote. All members vote. All members vote. Members, members, please, members, the House will be in order. Clerk will close the roll. Tally the vote, I 62, no, zero. Uh, the motion carries. In an extraordinary show of bipartisanship, the California State Legislature passed the Rick Walker bill at 3.30 in the morning. Though demonstrating that both parties could come together to do the right thing, of all the bills requiring a two-thirds vote, AB 1302 was the only one passed by the legislature that night. You know, I've carried legislation over my time in Sacramento that's certainly more significant in the big picture of things that affects the lives of all 35 million Californians. But um, that was probably the most satisfying moment uh, of my career in the Capitol. He changed my life and he changed my views as well about politics and politicians and what goes on in Sacramento. You know, it, it, it basically changed the way I think about that whole system. There is something there. There is something. There is a light in there, you know. It's not total darkness. There is a light. The ability to um, personalize legislation is something you should never lose. I think that uh, many, many members of the legislature try to keep that personal perspective. Sure, it only affected one person, but life is about hope. And when you don't have hope, why live? Something happened and we came together. Out of 80 assembly people, 73 of them came together. We've got to come up with what was that formula? What did we put in the Kool-Aid that day? And to see if we can't replicate it. In a Pollyanna world, you'd like people on both, from both parties to hold hands, resolve issues, uh, reach bipartisan agreement, uh, approve it, and, and, uh, and walk out of the Capitol to a round of applause. But that's just not the way it happens. In civic books, they talk about uh, electing leaders to, to come and, and, and join a group of people that will hash out things. Um, the, the history books, the civic books are wrong. That's not the real world. That's not what happens here. And I don't think it was ever intended to. We like to think that you know, when justice requires it, the legislature can rise above the partisan squabbling and, uh, and come to agreement uh, just because justice demands it. Uh, but it happens so rarely uh, when it happens, they applaud themselves and say, look what we did, but we would hope that that would be something that could happen every day up there. I understand why people are frustrated with the system. It sometimes seems as if the system is designed to get in the way rather than help us get justice for the people who deserve it. But that's where individuals come into the mix, where somebody like an Allison Tucker 
steps up and says, I'm going to make the system work if it takes me more than a decade. And you know, all the credit in the world goes to someone with that kind of commitment and that kind of tenacity to make sure that the imperfect system ultimately comes to the right conclusion. When the justice system convicts somebody for a crime he doesn't commit, that's a mistake you can never completely undo. A hundred dollars a day doesn't make up for years lost. Rick was in custody when his father died, when the grandmother he was close to passed away, when his son grew from being a, a young teenager to an adult. He missed years that he can never get back, and certainly you can't buy those precious life experiences for $100 a day. I'll tell you, from where I come, $100 a day is, you can live but it will never compensate this man for what he lost. Um, you can never take back a moment of your life. Once you've lived it, it's gone. You drive around, usually it's at hardware stores and paint stores and things of that nature. You see a group of guys and you pull up your car and they, hey, I want to come work. You need somebody to work. And, Today, they get $120 to $150. $100 a day, that's a joke. Just like that nickel, my life was only worth $100 a day. One of the worst things that's ever happened to me in my life, of course, is being the department head, the person with ultimate authority over that office that convicted him at the time that it happened. Um, it's one of the, you know, what, what worse thing can happen as a prosecutor than having an innocent person convicted and go to prison for 12 years? There are always going to be failures in the system. And the question is whether we have the will and the ability to confront those failures and to try and make things right. Uh, AB 1302 was one case, at least, when people had the will and the ability to say, we did it wrong and we're going to make it right. And that may be small satisfaction, but it's some satisfaction. Thank you.